Well, thank you. I will try to be I will try to be brief and, and within the time. Um, so I come from Polytechnic. Uh, we're an Austrian company. Our specialty is combustion. Anything that's biomass, we try to turn it into energy. But about 20 or something years ago at the start or the early 2000s, we started um, working on the production of we call it vegetable carbon or what you might call today biochar or carbonization or, or pyrolysis. So we have many terms. So the story goes um, in the early 2000s, we started or the people that started working on this project, uh, they were very interested in uh, carbonization and uh, producing or modern ways, let's put it that way, of producing charcoal, uh, which is maybe the earliest known form of, of uh, char or vegetable carbon. Just a side note, uh, I'm my specialty is more on combustion, not so much on pyrolysis, but I will do my best to present the technology and also answer your questions. So this will be more of a presentation on a commercially operating plant in Germany. It is not a research paper, and uh, hopefully it's an interesting one for you. So in the early 2000s, we started working on this, and we traveled the world looking at all the different technologies that are working seeing what was most reliable and then deciding on how we can make it more efficient, uh, automate it and uh, make it make it better, really. So uh, it started really early and we decided to focus not so much on output as much as on quality because the early, I'd say maybe early, earliest known uses of biochar, let's call it biochar for the sake of simplicity, although it has many terms, especially depending on the application, but let's call it biochar. So the many uses of biochar, the earliest ones we've known was the use as soil amendment and also for the production of energy as in burning charcoal and so forth. But we decided that there must be more of uh, for that. So we did a bit of research. And as you can see from this slide, there are actually many, many industries which can use natural carbon is or naturally sourced carbon, which is what biochar is it's a source of carbon so apart from the agricultural side or the energy or industrial side we have all these other uh, potential markets which do benefit and use uh, most of which i'd say maybe is also in the pharmaceuticals and medical field producing some very very unique products so this is what we wanted to uh, base our uh technology on. So all of these fields really require quality. So high carbon content, really high quality uh, chars or vegetable carbon. So this is what the focus was. And so we decided that for this purpose, we would base our work on a batch system on a batch. So it's not a continuous, it's not a fully continuous system. Uh, we decided on a batch system, on a high temperature, slow pyrolysis system, which would operate at high temperatures, so between 500 and 650 degrees Celsius, with a long enough residence time to produce really high carbon content chars uh, for these other applications. So in uh, early 2016, we built a fully commercial industrial plant in a place called Ulitz, Germany. It's in northern part of Germany, which is also used as a demonstration plant because at this site, we test many different feedstocks, biomass feedstocks. So this is what you what the site looks like. On the top left corner, you will see the production facility with the fuel yard. Um, and uh, we will go into the details um, on the next slides. So the gray or the blackish uh, building is the actual production facility. On the outside to the right, you have the drying containers where, where we prepare the feedstock and then the rest in the open air uh, storage yard. So on this site, we produce uh, about 3000 tons of char or biochar annually for different industries and different customers from varying feedstocks. I hope I'm not going too fast, Christian. Oh, good, good. Good, okay. So uh, each of these, so the process is made up of stations. I call them working stations or modules. Uh, and it goes from the feedstock, so the feedstock preparation, 
then drying, then we fill the retorts, uh, then we preheat it before, preheat the retorts of the material before it goes into the reactor, then we produce the char, then we cool the final product, and then afterwards we need this, this charred sieve, uh, crush, package, and then ship. Um, so it is, a, as you know, it's a, a pyrolysis plant is normally fully sustainable, it's self-sufficient energy-wise. So once the process is started, the, the energy released during the process of pyrolysis is sufficient to maintain the system running. Uh, we decided on a process which is very feedstock flexible. So uh, these are pictures from the actual open air uh, fuel yard that you saw on the previous slide. Now, this location here is unique because it collects green, green waste from pruning, uh, gardening, landscaping, and so forth as well. Because towards the end, I will explain in more detail. But this is what different feedstocks uh, on our uh, storage yard look like. So the flexibility of this technology allows us to use varying sized feedstocks, so different sources of feedstock, high and low moisture content feedstocks, as well as um, uh, 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 different ash content feedstocks. So as you see, there's a lot of really large uh, green waste, which, which we, of course, in some parts sieve, sort, but then fill the, uh, run the system on. These are all pictures from the on, on site. Um, we normally, so let me let me go back a few steps. So uh, we produce chars or biochar based on the quality which our customer desires. So we once the customer gives us a specification or tells us tells us the application, uh, and preferably has a specification or the characteristics they would like then we will go back and engineer what the feedstock needs to be. So, and we will source the feedstock and then produce the char based on that. So uh, at any given time, uh, we can produce up to four different types of char at the same time without stopping the, the plant from running, without repro re reprogramming and, and shutting down the plant. So that's one of the flexibilities of this system actually running at ULITS. On bigger systems, because we do, we can scale up, scale up from three thousand. I think it can go up to ten to twelve thousand tons of annual output. Uh, we can scale up, and then that, that will give us more fuel flexibility or more production flexibility. As you see, these are mostly residues, but we do, depending on the if the customer tends to ask for really high, high carbon content, mostly uh, low PAH and low ash content. A chars, depending on the application, let's say in the me uh, medical or pharmaceutical field, or even in the steel industry, then we might have to use um, we we chip logs or energy wood just to get the get the better better uh, performance. So after we prepare the feedstock, we load these uh, drying bins. We have at this site uh, twelve containers. They're used. They're uh, open to the elements, as you can see. They are uh, filled with different feedstocks depending on the cat of the customer. Every one of these, every one of these containers is called a batch, and it's about a 36, 38 cubic meter batch. And from these, uh, we will fill the retorts, which will be the next slide. So this is the drying process. We use the heat from the pyrolysis uh, system to, in this case, blow warm air about 80 to 60 degrees uh, through the process, through the fuel and it, it dries the fuel as it moves uh, through the bedding, but we also can produce indirect heating systems, for example, with warm water running through the walls of the container and so forth. But this is quite simple and it works really well. And this working station lasts about um, four days, depending on the moisture content of the feedstock, depending on the, on the conditions, climate conditions, but it's about four days. And then we can go uh, normally, our technology has a range of between uh, 20 to up to 60% moisture content of raw feedstock that can go into the process or into the drying, and then we will dry down to about 10%, between 8 to 10% uh, before it starts and goes inside the building. So once we've dried it, then we will, uh, these are roll off or roll on 
Avril containers, which means a truck can pick up the container and then move it to the unloading dock. Uh, in this case, in this case, the retort filling station. We have a big hopper. The full container is unloaded into the hopper. And then we have a chain conveyor, which uh, loads the retorts, as you see on the bottom right corner. The good thing about this process is it's fully uh, traceable. So we can trace every batch. So every container is traced to every retort because the retorts are numbered. And so we can follow every feedstock or every char from in input or inlet to outlet. And we can uh, show a customer a full chain of custody uh, if they require it as a final product. So we will fill the retorts. These are four cubic meter retorts. All, all is made out of steel. Uh, we've tried to really, it's carbon steel, so no stainless steel, no special materials. We've tried to keep the process or the production and the quality uh, as, I mean, the, 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 the material costs low as possible. And then after uh, the retorts are filled in the filling station, we will, before in, going into the pyrolysis, into the reactor, we have to preheat the material. We do it in a preheating station um, and we normally heat preheat the material uh, uh, up to 100, 120 degrees Celsius, uh, just to get to that threshold of where the breakdown of hemicellulose starts. So you start the pyrolysis process before actually going into the reactor, just to avoid having cold material feedstock going into a hot zone, we, we prepare it. And so this stage normally lasts between four to five hours. Um, and then I forgot to mention that the full system is, is the, the man manipulation once it goes into the, I call it a factory, into a green carbon plant is done by a automatic overhead crane. So the operators are normally all kept at a safe distance in the control room and they can supervise the, the, the whole plant, but there's actually no manual labor outside of the feedstock preparation, the fuel yard, once it goes into the retorts and into the into the building, there is no manual labor. Everything is automatic and a crane, an automatic crane handles the materials from station to station. So once we've started the process and let me play the video, it should play. So we can actually, we have a scale on, on the crane. We can measure, measure the, so this is the, the retort has one retort has finished the preheating process. A fresh one is going to replace it. So we do this so there is no, uh, so the the running time of the crane is very optimal, efficient. We have a scale on the actual crane, which tells us what the weight of the product or the retort is before pyrolysis and after pyrolysis. So we can also uh, kind of measure the parameters of, of, of how much we produced. Once we've preheated it, of course, uh, we have um, a very airtight system. So there is no air ingress or oxygen going into the pyrolysis zone. Uh, also, we have an indirect, the reactor is heated indirectly. So there is no contact between the flue gases or the hot gases, which are used to heat the reactor and between, between the char or the biomass material uh, with the flue gases, this maintains the purity, I'd say, and the cleanliness of the char is very high. So there is no contamination via the flue gases. So all the gases, which are all the gas, which is produced in the reactor is then taken into the combustion furnace where we completely uh, and officially uh, burn the uh, pyrolysis gas to uh, keep the process running. Then we take the flue gases and return them to uh, heat the indirectly heat the reactor. Uh, and I say the, the system is fully programmable. So depending on the char quality that you want and the feedstock that we use, we can program the residence time and the temperature of the, uh, in the, the reactor spent in the reactor. So the actual um, pyrolysis takes between two to four hours, depending on the feedstock and depending on the char, the biochar the customer has asked for. It's between two to four hours. That's why we call it slow pyrolysis. Um, and uh, once the production of gas or the off-gassing has, has subsided and fallen off, then 
it's it's one of the signs that the process is finished and we can remove that um report from the from the reactor as you see everything is fully automatic it's airtight it's sealed so the crane is removing a retort which has finished its process or the residence time in its reactor in the reactor it'll remove it what you see are flames because of the uh still slow release of the gases interacting with the oxygen in the air that's why you see a flame and then we have the retort, which has just finished the preheating. It's going into the reactor. And then the cover will close and the pyrolysis process will start. And from this station, uh, the next station is the cooling station is where we have to make sure that the produced char is inert, becomes inert. It's not reacted to its environments. As you know, uh, especially fresh or hot char is reacted with the oxygen in the atmosphere. So we have to make sure that in an oxygen-free zone, the char is stabilized. So the cooling station is cooled via forced air. So we'll take ambient air from the surroundings, blow it in through the cooling station and indirectly through the outside of the retort, uh, cool the retort and its content down to ambient conditions. And uh, this takes about 24 hours. Um, it's The retorts are placed on a sand bed, so there's no air or oxygen ingress. So the, the actual char is stabilized. And after 24 hours, we remove it. And we go into the packaging uh, zone. So this was the retort which we removed from the reactor which you saw a moment ago. It's going to the cooling station. So the important thing uh, to say about this is that even though it's not a fully continuous process, we have made it uh, with automation so that we have a continuous output of about one ton an hour uh, of, of char and we've program buffer zones in the plant. Buffer zones are zones where we, where we accumulate re, um, retorts um, uh, more than we actually use in the actual system in such a way that we uh, the, the plant only needs to run in two shifts, two eight-hour shifts. So we don't need a third shift, which would run overnight uh, to, to maintain the process going. We have these retorts, which means that the plant, the crane itself will handle everything in the, that third night shift, will handle everything inside the plant without requiring supervision. So that's one of the things that we have kind of thought of why, why keep people on site? Why, why incur those costs if the plant can operate sufficiently on its own? That's one of the benefits of having such an automatic, I'd say, automation in the plant. So the cooling, I said, is 24 hours. And once that is done, we take it into the packaging, or should I say first we sieve, then we crush, depending on the fraction required for the customer, the particle size they want, and then we package it, and then we remove it from the plant. The One of the system, one of the requirements actually of running this plant is to have a fully automated system and supervision and visualization. So this is just one of the screens that I'm showing you. We have cameras uh, at every station. Uh, we have to make sure that everything is running properly and visual uh, visualization is, of course, one of the ways to do it. Every, every element, every sensor, every retort, every batch, every temperature, every pressure, uh, every flow switch is shown to give the operators a very good understanding of the process. As I said, uh, every batch or every container is filled normally with different feedstock. Once we unload it, it goes into the retorts. The retorts are numbered, so we can actually trace every, every char, which is produced, to the retort number, and then back to the batch of the container, so we can tr show a customer a full chain of custody, especially if they require it, let's say, like in the pharmaceutical or the medical field which they have very strict reg regulations as to the feedstock they use. So we can actually provide that. 
And then based on the retort numbers, uh, and because of this traceability, we know exactly when each material was placed at, at which station, when the process started, when it finished, and when it's going to uh, complete its complete cycle. So just a quick overview of what I tried to show you in a few slides. Of course, I can't show you everything, but I do invite you and whoever is interested to visit the plant at ULIT. Of course, it's it's much more effective than seeing a few slides. So as you saw at the beginning, there's a lot of green waste on site. That's because on this operation, they process about 30,000 tons of green waste, which has a lot of soil and earth inside. Then they after that, they sieve it. So they remove the soil part from the woody or the green waste. And then uh, they will also, based on the char required, also also consume about five to 7,000 tons of biomass in, in ways of wood, wood chips. And the, and the output is about 20,000 tons of the terra preta soil, which is either packaged in big bags or in smaller bags, depending on the client. And uh, about 3,000 tons of char are produced. Just some examples of the biomass that we have successfully carbonized. We have remains of some pineapples, some nuts, uh, different different vegetables or different plants. Let's call it that, that way. Just showing that the process really uh, anything can be carbonized really and returned to its basic forms. So we do work with a lot of feedstocks. We can handle feedstock sizes from uh, five millimeters. So apologies, I'm using metrics, metric units, but uh, from five millimeters to 300 millimeters uh, and moisture content up to 60% moisture content at the inlet. And then uh, we can produce, so the aim, like I said, at the beginning was to produce high carbon content um, chars. And uh, we have produced, and we have certificates uh, to prove it, we have produced chars up to 98% carbon content. So C-fix 98%, very low ash, very low uh, PHS, uh, POX, so polyaromatic compounds. Um, and these are just some of the chars that we have produced. Of course, I'm sure you can recognize the, the initial feedstock based on the, on the, on the material you, you see out here. So, Apart from the wood chips, uh, logs, uh, firewood, you see corn cobs, you might see different uh, straws, uh, nuts, shells, and, and so forth. Some of the products that we need to produce, apart from the charcoal, uh, the standard charcoal, uh, barbecue charcoal, we do produce smokeless or smoke-free charcoal, mostly running on, um, for example, corn cobs. Uh, we produce terra preta, as I as I'm shown before. It's normally a mixture of ninety percent soil, ten percent char, and then it's packaged in either bulk and big bags or smaller bags for our customers. We are certified. The plant can be and is certified to produce different types of animal feed. So apart from the soil amendments, uh, we, we do produce different types of animal feeds. Um, and as you know, I just wanted to show some curiosity here. I mean, the application of char is very wide. These are some of the more modern, I guess, stylish uses in, in the foods and drinks that we consume or can consume on an everyday basis around the world. So that's also, also there. And uh, before ending, I just wanted to mention that we have, uh, realizing that the energy release, that the energy yield, um, is very great on a slow pyrolysis system. Uh, there's a lot of waste uh, or available heat left over even once the process itself is maintained and, and, and uh, taken care of. So we can close that cycle and produce electricity as well or additional heat for um, if, if required. So we can attach a small district heating system, attach a greenhouse, attach some dryers, grain dryers, wood drying kilns onto this, or we can produce electricity power and uh, to, to either maintain the process or sell it to a grid, just to make sure that the feedstock or the energy is utilized fully. Now, some people might say, why are we not using, or you might've noticed that we're not using uh, or producing any liquid byproducts such as vinegar or oils. Um, that is because the 
we could at an intermediate stage if we were to take the gas and cool it then we would condense it then we could produce those products but we have tried to keep the process simple and we have focused on producing high carbon content uh chars and energy so that's the focus of this of this plant just to keep the, the process simple environmentally friendly and uh, yeah that's that's it so Thank you for your, your attention. Once again, I will say that my expertise is in combustion. So please take it easy on me in, your, in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. That was a very interesting presentation about a very advanced process plan, I have to say. <laughs> and also interesting to see a, a batch system um, because uh, that's um, yeah not, not that that far or widely um, done. So uh, you got some questions in, in the chat, so I, uh, we can go uh, through them. Um, so the first one was from uh, Anna Erling, uh, who was asking, in our area, there's concern about air pollution from biochar plants. Um, what reliable data currently exists about pollution potential from biochar pyrosis uh, of various feedstocks? And I, I guess you, you have quite some insights uh, in into this question. <laughs> yeah, okay, let me, it's a very good question. I mean, if we look at how char is produced traditionally, then absolutely, um, then the the question of emissions is absolutely a problem. Uh, with the, with the, I'd say more modern or automated char uh, carbonization and pyrolysis plant, I'm just looking for a slide, that's what I'm talking. Um, it's absolutely it's absolutely different, at least in our case. So what we do is because let me let me share the screen again. Um, because we capture all the gas uh, and then we take that gas to the hot zone in our furnace in the combustion zone, we completely burn the gas. Um, and in that way, once we burn at high temperatures or constant temperatures, we can ensure that the emissions can be controlled as well downstream. So I hope you're seeing my screen. Yeah. Okay, yes. so this is just part of it. You can't see all of it. So um, this this uh, to the picture to the far right, this teal greenish color is the combustion. Uh, it's the furnace. We take the hot gas and burn it, and that's how we make sure once the uh, once the gas is combusted fully and efficiently, then the emissions are low. So. We also have the control for particle size down the stream. So multi-cyclone and uh, uh, electrostatic filter can be added. And in Germany at this site, uh, we have we fully abide by the local emission regulations. So it's just like burning wood or a pellet boiler or pellet stove. So it's very efficient that we can guarantee emissions. Basically, uh, any emissions in the EU, emission limits in the EU, which are very strict from Germany to Switzerland, we can guarantee those. Because the system is fully automatic, we combust all the gases fully in a controlled environment, and we control those uh, uh, parameters and conditions, we can guarantee those emissions, as opposed to a traditional open air or, or a traditional char production, which, which is uh, very high polluting. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, just as a quick follow-up uh, related to that. So, uh... Do you have any feedstocks you don't want to put into your system, something like with a high sulfur content, chloride content, or do you have any limitations? Um, for example, um, aqua aquatic plants or something like that? Uh, well, I will tell you this. We normally, if it's a if it's a fuel, it's a feedstock, so a fuel is the wrong word. If it's a feedstock, which we have not worked with before, we normally either ask for a fuel analysis or a feedstock analysis if the customer has it. Um, if not, we'll conduct our test ourselves based on a sample we require and we do it ourselves. Uh, normally we don't have problems um, producing charts from different types of even aquatic um, feedstocks. It's just a matter of what the emissions would be and what the final product would be result would be. So it might be that if we use a certain feedstock for let's call it an aquatic plant, the end result of the carbonization paralysis might not be uh, feasible. So you might not be able to get the quality you want to sell it. So that's the only thing. 
I, I'd have to say um, anything else downstream for emissions, we can always add additional equipment to control the emissions. But I think the most interest for people or for clients is, is from what can they get for their feedstock? So is the output material of sufficient quality to be used in a certain application they want? So normally, so like I said, we can do everything most of the time. It's just a matter of whether the end result is what the customer is looking for. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, let's go through the other questions to not go over the time. Um, so the next question was from uh, Jacek. Yes. Every time I get Jacek. Um, how do you manage the data for the plant specific material and energy balance? Um, this being a semi batch, do you run the balances on each batch or do you offset batches? So, and he's asking this from the perspective of the CDR calculation for the for carbon credits. So, so can you do it on a batch or uh, the the energy balance? Uh, is that what the the question yes. is? The energy balance. That's a, that's a good question. I would have to get back to you on that. Yeah, I don't know the details of how they would do that. Um. And then uh, Marshall uh, was asking, how do you ensure safety protocols during your automated shift? So I, I guess he refers to the overnight uh, shift you, ex you briefly explained. So uh, safety in terms of what if something happens in a plant, is it can it shut down safely or will something happen? OK, so we do have safety chains and uh, because of our experience with uh, combustion plants, so biomass combustion plants, it's we have more or less the same uh, or similar safety chain. So we have several backups in case a malfunction occurs, the plant will always shut down safely. So the worst thing that can happen is that there is the plant shuts down. There is no malfunction. So um, uh, because there are no operators, especially in the third shift, there are no operators inside the uh, plant. It's only a crane. So the worst thing that can do that can happen is for the crane to stop working and for the process to shut down. For example, uh, if the reactor, if the, the retort or the char is not removed from a reactor when the process is finished, what will happen is there will be no more pyrolysis gas production. And once there's no more pyrolysis gas production, the temperature uh, in the combustion chamber will drop and the energy yield or the will not be sufficient to maintain the process running and the plant itself will shut down. We have down the line emission control equipment, which will take care of the emissions. So really there's, uh, as a summary, there's nothing that can happen that uh, will be um, different than to a biomass combustion plant because it's fully automated. Automated. And maybe to add to that, uh, Polytechnic is a very big player in biomass combustion. <laughs> so, so just thank to, you. Yes, to, we, to we do our the, best. Yeah, yeah we do our best. Yeah, it, that's our specialty. We, so we do. We work with about hundred different hundred different hundred fifty different biomass fuels. Uh, which we have experience in, in working with. And we also do torrefaction, which is something that's off topic here, but we also we also do torrefaction as opposed to pyrolysis. So uh, since you mentioned that, we're actually involved in a project which is building the largest torrefaction plant in Europe and it's being built in Finland. It's a 60,000 ton per year output torrefaction plant um, where the products will be used as carbon neutral fuel to replace coal and cement plants and uh, thermal power plants. So so, so we have a, a follow up uh, presentation already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the last uh, two questions that I tried to summarize a bit as uh, do you do um, uh, performance trials on your, on your biochar? So do you do plant trials or, or any other trials yourself? Or do you uh, give that to the customer and uh, let them Try it out. Uh, well, well, what do you mean? Do we so test the, different feedstocks? So the question was, uh, have you performed any experiments on biochar usage in, in agriculture or something similar? Oh, I, I so the application of the final product, yes. have we experimented yes. that? No, no. So what we do, we are a technology provider. So we have recognized that there is a need for a product in the market and we have built a technology for it. The actual experimentation is done by the client. So the client will 
decide what they want to do, the application they want to use the char for. Based on that application, they will come up with a, with a char and um, require characteristics for that application. And then we will build or produce the char for that application. And then what they do with it after and the results that are generated is really up to the client. Okay, okay so um, there are two more questions in the chat. So if you can uh, just briefly answer them, that would be great, uh, just because we are a bit uh, over the time. Uh, just one quick question that I have to ask. Uh, so what's the biggest disadvantage of of the of this type of plant? What would you see as the as the pain point of of this system? Yes, I so it's thank you for asking that. Of course, no technology is perfect. There's no such thing. So thank you for pointing that out. Um I would say my in my opinion, and from from speaking with the people at the plant and uh, being at the plant several times is that I, the only downside I see is the low output. So uh, in today's uh, industry of scale and the market where people are asking, especially in the CDR market, they're asking for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions of tons of um, chars, then an output of a plan of between 3,000 and 10,000 output is quite insignificant. Let's call it that way. So that's maybe the the only downside I would say to this this kind of a setup, but the upside is the quality and the flexibility, and that's which if you can. So as I outlined on the second slide, maybe with that different markets and industries we can cater to, we have produced chars which have sold between five hundred to three five thousand euros per ton in the market. So we tend to go towards high quality instead of quantity. Okay. 